morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the seminar on protecting human study volunteers. I'm Stuart Laidlaw. I'm the director of the compliance office. And the reason that you're here this morning is because the government says you have to be here. Uh, what we're going to talk about today are human subject research regulations and the need to understand them. This is a mandate from the National Institutes of Health that anyone applying for federal funds has to have evidence of training in human subjects research regulations. There has been a considerable amount of publicity in the uh, national press recently about uh, abuses of human subject volunteers in research and uh, that has occasioned uh, a, a response from the government. Uh, and the kind of opinion that uh, the national press tends to try and uh, give of uh, medical researchers is shown in the next slide, which is a James Thurber cartoon. It says, you're not my patient, Mrs. Quist, you're my meat. <laughs> and that is uh, the prevailing uh, opinion as a result of a number of uh, small, a small number of highly publicized examples of research abuse. But we know that we are not that way, and we have nevertheless got to demonstrate that we have an understanding of the regulations. There are historical and contemporary reasons for you being here, and I'm going to touch briefly on the historical reasons and then go on to the contemporary reasons. There have been a number of uh, uh, well-publicized uh, horror stories involving human research over the past 50 or 60 years, starting principally with the experiments the Nazis carried out in the concentration camps. Following the Second World War, a convention was uh, brought together that developed what is known as the Nuremberg Code, which codified the uh, principles under which human research should be carried out. And all of the members of the uh, nations of the civilized world uh, signed off on the code and patted themselves on the back for not being like those nasty Nazis. Unfortunately, uh, there were existing research projects and subsequently uh, new research projects that were carried out in these supposedly civilized countries which fell into something uh, of the same nature as the Nazi experiments. And the one which was the dirty little secret of uh, the US Public Health Service was the Tuskegee syphilis study. And this was a study that was carried out uh, starting in 1930 and began with the best of intentions but continued with a total absence of concern for ethical principles. The Tuskegee syphilis study was uh, begun at a time when syphilis was endemic, uh, some might say epidemic, in the southern United States and there was no real effective cure other than somewhat draconian uh, use of toxic metals. Uh, and so they decided they wanted to look to see what the natural history of the progression of this disease was. And they went to Alabama uh, to an area where the disease was rampant both in the African American and in the Caucasian American population and they chose uh, the, uh, those people that would be least likely to be able to resist the uh, temptation that they offered to them which was free medical care. Uh, and they chose 400 uh, African American poor uneducated sharecroppers uh, who were uh, infected with syphilis and told them that they were being provided with medical care, nutritional advice and vitamins uh, and never told them that they were in a research study. Uh, they compounded this uh, when 10 years or so later penicillin became widely available for the treatment of diseases such as syphilis by continuing to study them, withholding treatment for the syphilis and uh, going so far as to uh, arrange for their deferment from the military in order to avoid them being in a situation where they would routinely be given penicillin if they were discovered to have syphilis. Uh, the study continued on up until the late 1960s at which time an investigative reporter found out about it and uh, blew the whistle on it. And the resulting public outcry uh, resulted in the series of events which led uh, to the regulations which we know today. So I guess some good came out of it. Uh, it was only the most prominent of a number of experiments that were carried out under government sponsorship. Uh, the, more recently we've become aware of radiation experiments that were carried out by the Department of Energy and its predecessors. 
um, involving uh, both uh, very high degrees of radioactive uh, exposure and very low degrees of radioactive exposure, but all characterized by the fact that there was no or little attempt to obtain consent from the, the subjects involved. Uh, some of the early experiments involving plutonium were carried out with the intent of finding out what the toxic effects in addition to the radiation effects of plutonium were. And these were carried out in uh, patients who were supposedly terminal patients uh, with the idea that they were going to die anyway and so it would not adversely affect them if they were given an injection of plutonium. Uh, the patients, some of them sub stubbornly refused to die, which caused them a problem. Uh, and uh, survived to experience the side effects of plutonium poisoning. On a much less uh, drastic scale, but equally unethical, in the 1950s there were a number of studies carried out uh, looking at intermediary metabolism through the use of small amounts of radioactive tracers of glucose and the like. And these experiments were carried out in orphanages in New England where the radioactive glucose was added to the milk that was fed to the children in these orphanages and then blood samples were drawn and so on and so forth. You'll notice that these children along with the terminally ill patients are peculiarly vulnerable because no one is there to act as their advocate. Uh, in the 1960s this uh, was also seen at Willowbrook uh, State Hospital with mentally retarded children uh, who were deliberately infected with hepatitis in order to study the effects of hepatitis. And the rationale that was used then was that these are children who were going to spend a considerable period of their life in an institutional setting and they would presumably get hepatitis anyway. So what was the, what was the harm in giving it to them up front? Well, you know, ethically it's, it's absolutely unacceptable. The response to Tuskegee was the typical government response, which was to set up a commission. And the commission... Uh, labored for a number of years and finally produced a, a report called the Belmont Report. Uh, unlike most government commissions and most government reports, however, uh, the Belmont Report actually was implemented and forms the philosophical basis for the federal regulations under which we all operate now. And the Belmont Report identified three basic principles that ought to govern the conduct of human subjects research. The first one is respect for persons, the second one is beneficence, and the third one is justice. The concept of respect for persons uh, is enshrined in the idea of informed consent. The idea that uh, people who are going to be involved in a research study are autonomous individuals who are capable of making their own minds up about whether they want to, to take part in a research study and who are owed the courtesy of being asked if they want to take part in a research study. You'll recall that the Tuskegee Syphilis uh, study cohort was never asked or told that they were being uh, enrolled in a research study. And uh, they can only give a consent to take part if they actually understand what they're being asked to do. And so the concept of informed consent involves giving complete, accurate, and understandable information in the preferred language of the subject. Now I know that there are many physicians at this institution who can give complete and accurate descriptions of what they're proposing to do to the subjects, but uh, whether the description is understandable depends on the degree of jargon which is included in uh, the description that's provided. So one of the things that our uh, office does is to attempt to make uh, consent forms that are produced by physicians more understandable. Uh, I'm not saying that people are, are out to uh, obscure what they're proposing to do, but people tend to fall into the jargon that they're, they're used to using when they're conversing with their peers. And so we try to make it more understandable. Also, uh, if your subject does, is not familiar with English, then they're hardly going to be able to understand a given form of consent uh, if uh, they are presented with a, a presentation in English. So we attempt to uh, produce consent forms in the language the subject would understand. The second principle is the principle of beneficence. The principle of beneficence uh, recognizes the fact that any enterprise involves risk. 
uh, research being uh, one of those enterprises but that when you are going to conduct research your attempt your, your aim should be to minimize the risks that are uh, the patients are going to undergo uh, and that you are going to do a, an analysis of the risks and match them against the benefits do a risk benefit assessment and if the risks outweigh the benefits then you should not do the research there are many things that it would be nice to know but where the risks involved in finding out probably outweigh the value of the information that you would gain and ultimately uh, the uh, beneficence principle uh, takes, the, takes the position that no harm should be done if you can't do any good so uh, that is the second principle the third principle is the principle of justice uh, the principle of justice uh, demands that the selection of subjects be equitable that people are not s singled out for study uh, in it because they happen to be vulnerable and be happen to be likely to say yes or, or not understand what's being done to them if you are developing a new drug that will benefit society as a whole then the risk that uh, uh, is involved in testing that drug should be shared equally uh, by society as a whole because they will share the benefit so you have to conduct some kind of an analysis of the type of people that you're going to study to ensure that as many uh, people from as many different ethnic groups uh, gender uh, age ranges are studied as possible uh, this has become the mantra of the National Institutes of Health and the FDA in the past few years because they recognize that narrowing your uh, recruitment to a specific group while it might scientifically make sense because you can decrease the number of variables that you are dealing with uh, narrows the generalizability of the of the data that you obtain so you can spend a lot of money to obtain very specific and very tight data about a very specific and very uh, narrow group of people uh, but you have no way of generalizing that information to other people so a lot of studies were uh, originally done where uh, the recruitment was limited to men and it was then pointed out that uh, you can't just automatically generalize the, the results you get to women uh, the aspirin study was a, was a good example of that so uh, the, the aim now is to make uh, recruitment into studies as e uh, inclusive as possible and that obviously poses a lot of problems uh, when you're dealing with people uh, and ethnic groups and, and genders who have a suspicion of, of medical research but it's, it's, it's something you should recognize and, ha and, and attempt to overcome the uh, Belmont reports findings were codified in federal regulation and there are two sets of federal regulations which we have to adhere to at this institution uh, depending on the source of uh, the the source of the money uh, for most government sponsored studies we adhere to 45 CFR 46 section 46 of chapter 45 of the code of federal regulations this is called the common rule because it was adopted in 1990 or so uh, by all of the uh, government agencies that sponsor research with the exception of the Food and Drug Administration and the reasons why the Food and Drug Administration are different I will get to later on in the talk but the Food and Drug Administration their uh, human subjects protection regulations are codified in 21 CFR 50 and 56 um, the oversight of the common rule regulations is carried out by an office called the office of protection from research risks until recently that was until recently located within the national institutes of health and is now called the office of human research protection and i'll use the two terms interchangeably because it's the same office uh, it's now located within the office of the Secretary for Health and Human Services as a result of an attempt to raise its visibility we are also governed by state regulations uh, California has its own codes <coughs> regarding conducting human research uh, that are enshrined in the health and safety code um, they uh, mirror to a large extent the federal regulations and they apply to any agency uh, 
that is conducting research that does not have an assurance with the federal government. Uh, so our institution, which has an assurance with the federal government, is exempt from adhering to the letter of the state regulations with the exception of a couple of points. One is that we have to provide subjects with an experimental subjects bill of rights. And the second is that the fines and imprisonments uh, uh, for failure to obtain informed consent, which are in the state regulations, apply to us just like to any other researcher in California. So we have certain additional uh, regulations in the state regulations that we have to abide by. What's an MPA? I'm, I'm going to get to that in just a second. It's a multiple project assurance. Um, that's the historical context. Let's now talk about the contemporary context. In 1998, the Office of the Inspector General, OIG, produced a report uh, which reviewed the functioning of the IRB system, the Institutional Review Board system, which is the way that we, conduct, we, we monitor and regulate research at the local level. They identified uh, several weaknesses in the process, principally relating to the fact that it was sort of spread out at the, the local level, and that was an intentional decision at the formulation of the regulations. They identified that IRBs were overburdened, which we are, uh, they were underfunded, which at this institution we are not, uh, and that there was a lack, a lack of federal oversight and enforcement and a general need for training in the basic regulations. And the Office of the Inspector General uh, made recommendations that uh, it felt that the government ought to implement uh, rapidly. Two years later, they went back to have another look and uh, discovered that there had been a lack of any action at the federal level uh, and identified the common rule as an impediment to change. Now, the common rule uh, was, uh, is an example of the law of unintended consequences. The original intent behind having all federal agencies operate under the same set of rules and regulations was to uh, ensure uniform, uniformity of application of the regulations to ensure that everyone understood uh, that it didn't matter if you went to the Department of Education, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, or NIH, you would have to follow the same regulations. And so it had a noble purpose. The problem is that when you get 17 federal agencies to agree to all abide by one set of rules, and then you want to change the rules, you have to get 17 federal agencies to agree to change the rules, and that ain't easy. And so the idea of revising the regulations to uh, help uh, alleviate the problems with IRBs uh, proved to be insurmountable because you can't get 17 federal agencies to agree to do anything. It took 10 years to get the common rule implemented. Um, one thing they did notice, however, was that there had been an, it, an increase of enforcement of the regulations by the uh, oversight uh, bodies, the FDA and OPRR. And just to go down a, a laundry list of uh, universities and institutions who have felt the, the wrath of the uh, agencies, uh, Duke University was shut down by OPRR, Rush Presbyterian Hospital was shut down, University of Illinois at Chicago, University of Colorado was shut down by the FDA, uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham, Oklahoma at Tulsa, the Health Sciences Campus, and Virginia Commonwealth University were all shut down by OPR because of failure to adhere to the federal regulations. And this was not just one thing here or a little thing there. This was massive failure to adhere to the federal regulations, principally caused by uh, inadequate funding of the, uh, the apparatus that would allow them to adhere to the federal regulations. Duke University, before the shutdown, had one and a half FTE, FTEs uh, involved in human subjects uh, regulation. Uh, after they started up again, they had 12 and a half FTEs, which kind of implies that they were understaffed before. Um, but this obviously has a profound effect on these prestigious institutions because it is embarrassing and it's also financially affecting them because it uh, removes from them 
the ability to get funding from the feds or from drug companies or whatever. And so it's not a, not a trivial matter. Probably the most uh, prominent case of uh, a problem with a clinical trial was a gene therapy trial in which a, a patient who was on a, th a trial for a correction of a urea cycle enzyme deficiency uh, suddenly died uh, for no apparent reason. When they investigated, they discovered that the investigators uh, were very lax in reporting adverse events that had occurred in the trial up until then to the FDA or to OPRR, and that their record keeping was very, very sloppy. Uh, and that uh, led people to kind of extrapolate and assume that all gene therapy trials were badly conducted and they put a halt to gene therapy trials for a while. Uh, Sh Secretary Shalala uh, got into the act by mandating increased training, which is why you're here, uh, and proposing draconian criminal penalties for abuses. We're talking a quarter of a million dollars per episode. Uh, Congress began to get into interested, and that's always a bad sign when uh, congressmen get interested uh, in anything because uh, they tend to grandstand and uh, browbeat people. Uh, and the president, in spite of all of his distractions with other issues, also endorsed the idea of additional steps to protect human subjects. Locally, We've had a number of actions occurring. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the fact that the West Los Angeles VA Medical Center uh, was shut down by the National Veterans Administration and then had its uh, assurances pulled by OPRR for both humans and animals. And they're, taking, they're getting back up and running, but it, it takes a long uh, time and a lot of money to get back up and running. Uh, about five or six years ago, UCLA got involved in a very messy uh, case uh, involving schizophrenia research in which uh, the father of one of the, uh, the subjects in the trial who had suffered a bad uh, outcome uh, kind of made it a personal career of going after schizophrenia research. And we were kind of tangentially involved in that and tangentially affected by it. And then more recently, um, Charles Drew University School of Medicine, uh, and I, I say this not to be uncharitable, but they kind of jumped before they were pushed and uh, elected to close down their, res their clinical research activities until such times as they had reorganized their uh, IRB and their compliance function. Um, so they're getting close. Now, this institution has, uh, is dependent upon the income it receives from grants and contracts. So we cannot afford to be shut down. Uh, Duke University, for all the embarrassment that was caused there, uh, has endowments, it has, uh, it has uh, money from teaching and all the, all the other stuff that goes with a full-scale university. We are dependent on grants and contracts. And hence, we have to respond, and this is our response. What I'm going to do over the next, the remainder of the talk is uh, go over some of the definitions and uh, t hit some of the hot button topics that are involved in uh, current uh, controversies over research. So it will not be by any means comprehensive, but it will, I think, allow you to pass the test which we have available for you to pick up at the end of this, this presentation. And the first thing I want to do is to walk over to the other side of the auditorium with a view to providing some kind of visual uh, excitement in an otherwise dull and uh, uninteresting presentation um, and tell, ask you what is research and when in doubt you fall back on what the regulations say. Research according to the federal regulations is a systematic investigation including research development, testing and evaluation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. And that is what we define as research and it, uh, it is the uh, starting point for my discussion of what is not research because it's often difficult to tell what is research and what it's easier sometimes to decide what is not research. My operational rule of thumb about research is do you intend to publish it? If you intend to publish it, it's probably research. 
with one exception, the exception that I make in terms of what is uh, publishable but not research is case reports. And I know that uh, some people here uh, on campus would disagree with me by, about that, but from my perspective, case reports are anecdotal and they're hence not generalizable. And if you recall, one of the definitions of research was that it was incre increasing the uh, pool of generalizable knowledge. So if it's not generalizable, then it's not research. They're generally not systematic either. Of course, there are always circumstances where you kind of verge towards research. If instead of doing one case report, you're talking about accumulating data from 20 or 30 patients, then you're beginning to verge towards research and you ought to consider having it reviewed by the IRB. What is definitely not research is the provision of clinical care. That's what you do for a living. Uh, it's not systematic, it's, it's individualized. Uh, what is not research is quality assurance, which you do in order to improve patient care at this institution. That is again part of your job as physicians and nurses, uh, is to assess what you're doing and try to do it better. Of course, if you then propose to publish it, then you're tending towards research and you really ought to have it reviewed. Um, review of individual medical records for the purpose of delivering patient care is not research. Reviewing 500 medical records for the purpose of developing a, a hypothesis is research. The problem is finding the dividing line between the two and that's always difficult and uh, there's no easy answer as to where research begins and where patient care ends. Um, one thing that might make the Department of Pathology happy is that uh, the definition of the a human subject in the regulations is a living individual about whom an investigator conducting research obtains data through intervention or interaction with the individual or identifiable private information. Therefore, by the definition in the regulations, a cadaver is not a human subject. I guess it's an ex-human subject. However, uh, pathology isn't entirely off the hook because they basically trade uh, most of the time in samples removed from a living human uh, and they are by extension human subject originated and hence are covered by the definition of what is involved in research. So they are human subject uh, material. So uh, cadaver research is, is, I guess, not human subject research and is not re should not be reviewed by the IRB. We operate under an assurance and an assurance is basically a contract that we enter into with the federal government, with the Office of Protection from Research Risks. Some institutions uh, which are small and carry out very few research projects uh, will prefer to enter into an individual contract for each research project that they're involved in. And they have uh, a number of single project assurances. Cal State Dominguez has a single project assurance for one of its studies. Larger institutions like ourselves, where we conduct multiple studies, uh, enter into a general assurance, a multiple project assurance, which allows us to carry out research according to a set of principles, guidelines, and rules that we set forth and which uh, the Office of Protection from Research Risks buys off on. Uh, we have a multiple project assurance. Its number is M1301 and uh, it will be on the front of any of your uh, grant applications that go to NIH. This assurance defines our relationship with the Department of Health and Human Services, sets out our responsibilities and the procedures we will use to protect human subjects. It sets out the responsibilities of the institution, the IRB, compliance office, the investigator. It's a binding commitment which the institution enters into on behalf of its investigators. So if you're conducting research at this institution, like it or not, these are the rules that you have to abide by. And it's the standard against which we will be judged if there should be a, an audit by Office of Human Research Protection. So uh, you should understand that that is the rules that you live by you will get a copy of the assurance uh, as a bonus prize when you pass the test along with your certificate. The assurance covers all research involving human subjects regardless of the sponsorship. 
Although the assurance is entered into only with the uh, uh, NIH for federally uh, funded research, most institutions expand it to include all research, including drug company research or uh, unfunded uh, research or research from charitable, sponsored by charitable organizations. And it covers research which is REI sponsored, in other words, a, a grant that comes through REI uh, as, the, uh, as a, the awardee institution. Uh, it covers research conducted by REI personnel or agents, so if you're an employee of REI uh, or you're uh, being employed on behalf of REI, then uh, the research uh, that you do is covered by this assurance. If it's conducted using REI properties or facilities, so if you do it on campus here, if you use any facilities, it's covered. And for uh, any use of non-public information to contact prospective subjects, the reason I mention that is the uh, uh, the good folks up at the main campus sometimes see uh, Harbor as a, a candy jar that they can dip into at will. Uh, they can't. If they are going to involve themselves down here at Harbor, they're covered by our assurance. We have to be able to regulate them. The assurance mandates continuing oversight of our studies, including regular audits of studies. Now that's something we hadn't done until recently because we didn't have the manpower. Now we have a, a, a monitor in place who is going out to the, the various sites and will, as a service to you, will audit your uh, record keeping practices and the like in order to ensure that you keep up to the appropriate level and that will make it easier for you to withstand audits from uh, your sponsors. Uh, we also uh, the assurance covers research sponsored by REI but conducted elsewhere. Uh, it must be approved by the other side IRB. So if you're going to do a, a research study here and at Drew, our approval does not permit you to do the study at Drew. You have to get the approval of the Drew IRB as well. And that just keeps everything very clean. Let's talk about the Institutional Review Board because that's the uh, body that actually mo monitors what's going on on campus in terms of human research. The regulations state that the IRB should have at least five members. We actually have two IRBs that meet, uh, each meets once a month. Uh, each of our IRBs has about 20 members. It must include scientists and non-scientists. Uh, we have non-scientists in our, our uh, IRBs, basically to provide a non-scientific perspective on you know, what may seem like a really neat idea from a scientific perspective. Someone else may have an idea that it's not quite as neat from a, a human perspective. The committee cannot be all men or all women, cannot be all physicians, and must have at least one member otherwise unaffiliated with the institution. We have uh, two or three members on each committee who are otherwise unaffiliated with the institution. And again, that pr provides a perspective uh, from outside the institution uh, that is not colored by membership in the institution. And if vulnerable populations are being studied, they must have members with special expertise on the committee. So if we are studying psychiatric uh, patients, then we should have psychiatrists and psychologists on our IRBs, and we do. If we're studying uh, children, then we should have pediatricians on our IRBs, and we do. Uh, because they have special insights that other members might not have and they are there to act in some regards as an advocate for the particularly particular vulnerable group. Our IRB has a chair, an associate chair in each IRB. Uh, Dr. Phillips is the chair of both IRBs. Each IRB has an individual associate chair. Dr. Donaire over there is one of the associate chairs. And then we have vice chairs who are with the associate chairs uh, the workhorses of the, the system because they're the ones who conduct the primary uh, review of the protocols and then they follow up with adverse events, amendments, any other requests uh, that come in after, after the protocols approved. Then we have members and then we have compliance office staff including myself who serves as a vice chair on both committees and the, the reason for having me as a vice chair is because it allows us to uh, expedite simple uh, changes uh, in, in simple amendments and simple changes to protocols uh, without having to uh, go through the process of going to the full committee or seeking out another vice chair. So I do have some useful purpose, I believe. Um, there are criteria in the regulations for the approval of research. 
Um, the criteria involve uh, the implementation of the principles of uh, respect for person, beneficence and justice. These criteria here are in regard to beneficence. Uh, the risks are reasonable in relationship to the anticipated benefit. You have to perform as an IRB a risk benefit analysis. The risks are minimized by using procedures which are consistent with sound research design and wherever appropriate by using procedures already being performed. And people sometimes say to us, how dare you criticize our study as being badly designed? Well, we dare because the regulations say we have to. Uh, so re sound research design is important because if the research design is not sound, then the patient should not be exposed to the risks. Criteria for approval include uh, the prin principle of justice. Selection of subjects must be equitable. So we have to look at the population you're proposing to study and you have to justify why a particular group may or may not be included. Uh, uh, the principle of respect for persons. Informed consent must be, will be sought in most cases and informed consent will be documented by the use generally of a consent form. And so the committee reviews the consent forms for understandability and for completeness. When appropriate, it can demand adequate plans for monitoring the research, particularly if it's a high-risk study. Um, and uh, we have done that in the past. Uh, also, they have to uh, review the provisions for protecting confidentiality. Confidentiality is one of the hot-button topics we'll get to later on. Uh, and they have to review additional safeguards for vulnerable populations, particularly people who are not capable necessarily of making an informed decision themselves about whether to take part in research. Children, people with mental disabilities, and the like. What is the authority of the IRB? I'm glad you asked. Well, the IRB has the authority to approve a research protocol, require modification of the protocol, or disapprove a protocol. So they have a whole spectrum of, of options. In general, they will re require modification of a protocol to obtain approval. Um, the IRB's decisions, of course, are subject to review at higher levels. Uh, the institution can decide not to uh, undertake a protocol even if the IRB has approved it because it may not fit in with the institution's mission uh, as perceived by the board of directors uh, or it may, may not be uh, regarded as being politically astute to, to implement a particular protocol if it's a controversial one. That's the institution's decision. However, if the IRB has disapproved a protocol, the institution is not uh, permitted to overrule the IRB's decision. So even if the institution is due to make $100 million from a protocol, if the IRB says it's badly designed and it's unsafe and we're not going to approve it, uh, then the institution can't overrule the IRB. IRB is uh, obliged to conduct ongoing review of protocols no less frequently, frequently than once per year, but sometimes more frequently, sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, this is in the federal regulations. And the prevailing sentiment at the national level is that continuing review, uh, rather than being just a two-page form that you fill out and submit once a year, continuing review ought to be more thorough than the in initial review. Uh, because by the time you get to the continuing review, if you've studied patients, you know a lot more than you did before you started the protocol. So there's a, a, a sort of sentiment at uh, the Office of Human Research Protections that says you've got to do a lot more than just uh, block approve all the continuing reviews. And uh, that's something that's giving me nightmares. Um, the IRB approval covers the consent document to be used. Consent documents are only valid when they're uh, stamped with a current date stamp if you don't have a date stamp on your consent form or the date stamp is out of date, then the consent form is not valid and it can't be used. Uh, approval is limited to no more than once per year. Therefore, if you have a consent form, you have to get it renewed once a year at the time of continuing review. And this is in the regulations. We have no choice on that. Uh, so uh, that is why we keep bugging you to get your continuing review in because we want you to keep your projects active if you're still uh, uh, conducting them. And we have taken to actually closing projects down if they don't get continuing review in a, in a timely manner. 
IRB must approve all protocol changes in advance uh, except to eliminate, eliminate immediate apparent hazard to the patients. But amendments that are submitted by uh, sponsors to investigators, any addenda that you want to add to the protocols have to get prior approval from the IRB. And the IRB, in order to perform its function of protecting human subjects, must be informed promptly of adverse events, particularly those occurring to our patients, because those are the ones that we have the most proximate control over and are, are most concerned about. But in the case of multi-site studies, we still need to see all the adverse events from other sites. And that could be a trem that's one of the burdens that the I IRBs labor under, because sometimes you get hundreds of adverse events reported. The IRB may require audit and oversight of ongoing studies. Uh, the IRB has the authority to do for-cause audits or to do random audits uh, or to do audits based on some kind of algorithm uh, that uh, identifies higher risk protocols and we are doing all three. For non-compliance with IRB uh, decisions, the investigators can be suspended from conducting research. If they are suspended, they will be told of the reasons for the suspension they can have their grants and contracts monies frozen. Uh, they may be reported to uh, federal authorities if, if it's uh, deemed to be appropriate. And they will be given remedial options to permit them to resume their research activities. In the event of egregious violation, and this is where it gets really sticky, the feds can move in and they can choose to suspend the institution's MPA because of the activities of one investigator. Uh, they can choose, and, and particularly because of the uh, non-action of the institution in rectifying the problems with an individual investigator. They can choose to withdraw permission to conduct FDA uh, monitored trials. That's what happened at the University of Colorado. And they can post an investigator's name on an internet page for all the world to see. So uh, you, you get out there in cyberspace. Uh, I'm going to discuss later on uh, the additional protections that are afforded to vulnerable populations, but I'm going to mention them here because they're part of the federal regulations. There are subparts con uh, concerning fetuses, pregnant women, and in vitro fertilization, and concerning prisoners, and concerning children. Other people with vulnerabilities include people with altered mental capacity that they never managed to figure out how to write and enshrine as a subpart are people uh, with, who are economically disadvantaged. And we'll talk about all of those. Now we're going to talk on hot-button issues uh, that are coming to the fore. Uh, the vets are becoming increasingly interested in the process of re recruitment, particularly to pr clinical trials. And the Office of the Inspector General has issued a report on the issue of recruitment and finds that there are deficiencies in the way that recruitment is monitored by IRBs. <clears throat> recruitment uh, subjects should be recruited as widely as possible, first of all, unless there is a compelling scientific justification for recruiting, uh, uh, narrowing recruitment to, uh, uh, or restricting recruitment to narrower groups. Uh, examples where you could provide a compelling scientific justification is studying men only for a study on male contraception. That's a kind of a no-brainer. Uh, or restricting recruitment to adults for a disease that does not occur in children. But in general, uh, you really have to consider recruiting as widely as possible uh, in order to increase generalizability. Uh, issues of incentives are uh, a particular, of particular interest to the FDA. The, uh, the common rule is silent on the issue of uh, incentives. The FDA regulations are silent, but the FDA guidelines, which are the equivalent of regulations because everyone follows them, uh, discuss the issue of incentives. And they consider incentives to participate to be okay unless the incentive becomes a deciding factor in the subject's decision. So if you're offering 500 cc's for a 5 cc blood draw, no, $500 for a 5 cc blood draw, you're probably uh, going to find that the $500 becomes the deciding factor in taking the subject's decision to participate and not their altruistic w wish to aid the advancement of science. Uh, it's also inappropriate to withhold uh, the incentive to ensure completion of the study. It's not uh, inappropriate to offer a bonus 
for completion of the study, but you can't hold the subject hostage by saying if you don't come for all ten visits, then you don't get paid anything. These people are doing you the favor of contributing their time, inconvenience, and discomfort uh, to help you conduct a research protocol. If they can only make nine visits and for some reason can't make the tenth, they should still be compensated for the nine that they do attend. Uh, recruitment must also emphasize the voluntary nature of participation and that's something you have to keep hammering that this is not a condition of continued medical care taking part in your research study. There are possibilities for non-financial -fin coercion also and they center around the, the fact that you are a physician or a nurse or uh, some other professional and you are interacting with subjects often on a physician-patient basis. And it's very difficult sometimes for subjects to distinguish where your interaction as a clinician ends and your interaction as an investigator begins. Um, and that's important because if they don't realize it, you have to realize it. You have a divided loyalty when you're conducting a research study. You're not only uh, there uh, providing uh, health care for your subjects, but you're also uh, involved in conducting the research. And that can divide your loyalty, and if you're unaware of it, it c you can run into problems. Also, if you're recruiting from within your own staff, you have a potential for coercion that you may not even realize. If, you're, if you say to you know, all the people in your lab, I need five cc's of blood for this, this test I want to do, you're the boss, who's going to say no to you? But you know, people might feel very uncomfortable at, at being asked to donate a blood sample just because you want one. So you have to remember that. I'm not saying that everyone does that or it's a, it's a big problem, but it's, it's, it's there is a potential problem. For recruitment, FDA views advertising as an extension of the informed consent process. Uh, anything that you use to get the word out to subjects, potential subjects, uh, is viewed as being part of the consent process because it's providing information. And so all advertising materials must be reviewed by the IRB. Uh, and that would include flyers, posters, etc., etc., uh, all the way to internet websites. And we do this, uh, this is one of the things I can do as a vice chair, I review all the advertising, uh, I edit it if there are things that should not be there. Uh, if you've done it on your 1984 dot matrix printer, then I will hand it over to our communications department to make it look nice. Uh, but And we do a turnaround of that in about 24 hours. But all advertising materials must be submitted for review, and we'll stamp it, and then you have documentation that the IRB has seen it. Now let's talk about informed consent. Uh, in the regulations, informed consent is a fundamental requirement. Uh, that the consent of the subject is uh, going to be obtained ahead of time unless certain specific conditions, and I'll get into these, uh, unless the consent is waived by the IRB, unless it's specifically identified as not requiring consent in the federal regulations, unless the research is carried out under the emergency research exception to the requirement for informed consent, and please don't anyone even think about doing that at this institution because if you do you'll see my car disappearing over the horizon because this is so onerous that uh, it's practically impossible to carry out uh, or uh, the consent of the subject is not required if the person is incapable of inf giving informed consent and an appropriate person signs on the subject's behalf that's just a, a sort of a, a, a trivial thing um, the requirements for informed consent are in the federal regulations. The elements are all there. There has to be a statement that the study involves research, the purpose of the study, how long the subject will be involved in the study, a description of the procedures, and an identification of which procedures are experimental, a description of any reasonably foreseeable risks or discomforts, a description of any benefits to the subject. Uh, are more likely to others because in most research studies subjects do not individually benefit. Uh, if you knew the subject was going to benefit then it wouldn't be research. They may incidentally benefit but that's, that's accidental. Um, more likely it's a description of potential future benefits to others and a discussion of any alternative treatments that might be advantageous to the subject. 
Uh, and this is where you have to be careful because you do not wish to appear to make it that the research is the only option that subjects have. Clearly they have other options. If they decide not to take part in the research, they will get whatever normal clinical care they would, they would get. The only situation where there is no alternative is if they're acting as a, a, as a normal volunteer. And there the alternative is not to take part. There has to be a statement describing the extent, if any, to which confidentiality will be maintained. And we have a statement in our consent form regarding who can look at the data. The FDA, if it's an FDA-sponsored study, the sponsor of the study, the IRB has to be able to look at the, the records uh, in order to uh, you know, ensure that the, uh, the record keeping is correct. Uh, there has to be an explanation of whether, not if, but whether compensation uh, or treatment are available in the event of injury. Um, if it's a drug company sponsored study, we normally insist that there be compensation for research related injuries. Uh, there has to be a statement of who to contact regarding the research and any issues about subjects' rights, and that's in our consent form. There has to be a statement that participation is voluntary. Again, they're hammering away the fact that the participation is voluntary and the refusal is not penalized and the subject can withdraw at any time. These are all elements that are in the framework of our consent form uh, that you, you will get from the compliance office. There may be additional elements if the IRB uh, believes that they're necessary. A statement that unforeseeable risks may arise, and we have that. Uh, a statement of what conditions you may be dropped from a study even if you don't want to be dropped from the study. Uh, any additional costs to subjects, we try to avoid that at wherever possible. Uh, any orderly procedures for withdrawal, if, you, if you're a subject and you decide not to take part in the study and you're receiving a drug, it may be necessary, whether you like it or not, to go through a series of steps to avoid some kind of rebound phenomenon uh, when you, you come off of the drug. Uh, any new findings should be reported to the, the subjects. Uh, the number of subjects participating may be important. Uh, it may be important to you to know that you're one of five as opposed to one of 5,000 subjects that are in this particular study. Uh, that, that may enter into your decision making. In California, additional things that we have to do, as I mentioned earlier, is the subjects must receive a copy of the Human Subjects Bill of Rights. This is attached by the Compliance Office to each approved consent form and is attached uh, in both Spanish and English. So you don't need to worry about that, but just make sure that it's always attached to your consent form when you're uh, dealing with uh, uh, enrolling a patient. Before we talk about waiver of informed consent, I want to just mention again that consent is a process. Consent is not a form. And that a process of informed consent involves a dialogue between the investigator and the individual. Uh, the, the investigator sits down with the individual, tells them what is involved in the study, seeks their questions, answers their questions. They may use the consent form as a tool in that dialogue, but in actual fact the process is not a piece of paper. The piece of paper is merely the documentation at the end of the process that the uh, process has taken place. So please don't confuse the consent form with the, the process of informed consent. There are circumstances where it's a, it, it may be possible to waive the requirement for informed consent. But those are uh, only in rather specialized circumstances and they have to meet four criteria. Uh, there has to be uh, no more than minimal risk to the subject. So, you know, open heart surgery uh, ain't going to qualify. Uh, the waiver uh, of informed consent should not adversely affect the rights or welfare of the subject. And that's fairly easy to, to determine whether it will or will not. Um, the fourth one is that wherever appropriate, the subjects will be provided with additional information uh, after participation. So you may have to disseminate the information to your patient population. The one where it, uh, it is, is the kind of kicker is the research could not practicably be carried out without the waiver. So what would qualify for that? Well, an example is a study that we approved with a waiver where uh, an investigator wanted to do prospective follow-up of all the children in Los Angeles County 
who had uh, cardiac problems. Uh, and it involved multiple hospitals, it involved 6,000 cases. Uh, and we agreed that he could not practically carry out the research if he had to go around and seek the consent of all 6,000 families. Uh, and that it was an important study uh, that the, the uh, rights and welfare of the subject would not be in, uh, impacted, that it was minimal risk and that he would develop ways of providing information on what he found out to the subjects as a whole after the study was carried out. So in that case, it was appropriate uh, for a waiver. But the committee doesn't do it too often. <coughs> One thing you need to know is how to ensure subjects' understanding of the information provided. Well, the first thing to do is to provide the consent form written at an appropriate level of language. And one of the things the compliance office staff does is to simplify uh, the consent forms that are provided for, to it in draft. And it does that using 10 years of experience in doing this. It attempts to be consistent. It will not always be consistent, but it does its very best to be consistent. Uh, the person who does it has been doing it for a long time, and she knows what she's doing, and she's very conscientious. So uh, my advice to you as investigators would be to, uh, to accept and benefit from her expertise and use it wherever possible. Um, the, uh, now I'm going over the issue of, of, of consenting. Uh, explain the project clearly and answer all the questions in a dialogue. Question the subject. That may be important because people will often nod their heads when you, you tell them things and you think, oh, they're understanding it, but then you ask them a question, they don't understand it at all. So ask the question. I mean, this is common sense stuff. Ask the subject a question and see if they can tell you what it is you've told them. Uh, provide sufficient time for the subject to be able to make a reasoned decision. Uh, it's not appropriate to wait until the patient is on the gurney being uh, uh, ready to be rolled into the operating theater to ask them if they'd like to consent to a, a new method of anesthesia. Uh, the patients have to have time to make up their, their mind and think about it. And then after they, take, uh, they agree to take part in the study, you should continue to question the subject and provide feedback during their participation. And that pays off for you too because the more that you interact with the subject, the more likely they are to stay in the study because they will feel a bonding with you. And you also probably elicit information that you might not otherwise get by close questioning of the subject as to what's going on. People may not report adverse events because they rationalize that they really there's nothing to it, but you know, it's important to know uh, what their adverse events are. So closely questioning them will, will sometimes draw that out. If the subject's primary language is not English, the uh, consent process should occur in the primary language. So if you have a Spanish-speaking patient, then you should have someone discuss the uh, protocol with them in Spanish. Uh, you can use relatives, interpreters, or bilingual staff. Relatives are difficult because you don't know what they're telling them, and sometimes culturally they will attempt, they will attempt to minimize risks uh, because it's not considered to be culturally acceptable to talk about bad things. Um, uh, but interpreters or bilingual staff. This is a hospital where a large proportion of the patient population is Hispanic. You, must, you should have bilingual staff uh, if you're not bilingual yourself. The consent form can be provided in the primary language, but remember that is just the documentation of the process. It's not uh, the process itself. And we will provide translated consent forms using a certified legal translation, translation service uh, if you request them. And it will be at no cost to you as the principal investigator. It comes out of the institutional overhead. And finally, just one final point. If you can't communicate, if you find that rare individual who speaks an odd dialect of Serbo-Croat and you have no one that can communicate with them, they don't have to be enrolled. Uh, you, there's no law that says that someone who meets all the entrance criteria has to be enrolled in your study. So bear that in mind, that you don't have to enroll a subject if you can't communicate with them and can't obtain their informed consent. For patients who are mentally disabled, uh, there are two conditions, either temporary mental disability or permanent. If there's permanent disability, these people often have uh, persons who have been assigned power of attorney for their uh, health care 
or they may have an appointed conservator. You've got to be careful with conservators. Some of them are allowed to make decisions about research and some of them are not. You have to determine what category they fall into. If the patient is temporarily disabled, perhaps in a coma or disoriented or some other uh, situation which is impairing their ability to make a, a rational decision about whether to take part in research, uh, it may be possible to seek the consent of a close family member, um, such as a wife, a child, or a parent, or in, in these enlightened days, even a long-term companion, if they've uh, been uh, cohabiting for a, a period of time. Uh, but again, you've got to be careful uh, because remember, you're not getting the consent of the patient, you're getting the consent of somebody else. And it, it behooves you to take uh, extra care in making sure that that person is uh, both uh, capable of giving consent and legally authorized to give consent. So think about that a little bit. Risks are defined in the federal regulations as follows. And this is where uh, we get into uh, the, the question of minimal risk. I've, I've mentioned minimal risk a couple of times so far. Minimal risk is the probability and magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research are no greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. Clear? Everyone understand that? Uh, this is probably occasion more discussion uh, in human uh, research circles than, than any other uh, pa uh, sentence or, or phrase in the federal regulations because what is minimal risk? What does this mean when it's defining minimal risk? Uh, there are the strict constructionists who would say that minimal risk involves any risks that a normal healthy person would encounter in their everyday life and that's what they mean by minimal risk. There are the more creative people who say well, yeah, okay, but supposing you're a patient who has chronic heart disease uh, and you're being seen by doctors every couple of weeks or every month and they're doing all, a whole battery of tests and they're doing catheterizations and they're doing stress tests and they're doing this and they're doing that. Um, in that case, from your perspective as a patient with heart disease, uh, doing an additional stress test is no more than minimal risk because it's no more than you would ordinarily encounter in your daily life as a sick person. And uh, you know, people have philosophical discussions that can go on for hours about what, regard, what regarding what is minimal risk. And I'm not sure which is right. I could make arguments on both sides. But you should be aware that when we're talking about minimal risk, uh, that is the definition that we're, we're talking about. However, it is possible to identify types of risk, and some of those types of risk are some that you may not have considered. Obviously, if uh, there is a risk of physical harm in any procedure that involves a, a drug or some kind of medical procedure. But there are also a possibility of psychological harm, uh, such as uh, distress caused by having to answer sensitive questions about things that you'd rather not think about. Uh, there's the risk of legal harm if you happen to answer questions that reveal your prior or current illegal activities, such as drug use. And if those uh, answers fell into the, into the hands of the wrong people, actually the right people, the, the police. Um, there may be risks of social harm if uh, the, your revelation of intimate information uh, falls into the hands of other uh, persons. Um, there may be the risk of economic harm, such as uh, uh, caused by the revelation of private information, such as your HIV status, or, or whether you have a genetic marker that uh, may predispose you towards a particular type of cancer. So there are all sorts of risks that have to be uh, considered when you're conducting a research study that you have to protect the, the subjects against. The uh, risk of breach of confidentiality can lead to serious consequences uh, to a subject's social, legal, or economic status, and you must therefore have uh, procedures in place to protect the subject's privacy. You may want to have uh, retention of data without identifiers. Uh, if you don't need the identifiers, then why would you want to keep them, other than you know, for completeness or you know, being anal compulsive? 
Um, if you use coding to restrict access to the patient's ID, that's a, a possibility for protecting patient confidentiality. Um, uh, it's possible if you are dealing with highly sensitive information to seek a certificate of confidentiality, which is a document that is issued by the federal government, uh, which uh, is intended to protect research data from subpoena searches. Um, but uh, I don't think it's ever been tested in court as to whether it would actually stand up uh, to vigorous uh, attempts to, to overturn it. But it is a possibility that you can s seek such a thing. Now let's talk about vulnerable groups and the special protections that are in place for them. And I should say at the beginning here that uh, the special protections that were put in place were put in place about 20 years ago. And uh, since then there has been an evolution of thinking about uh, inclusion of mm. subjects in research. And to some extent the, the, the regulations clash with the prevailing thinking, particularly about protection of children versus inclusion of children in research. And so there may be two opposing things going on and it's, it's sometimes difficult to navigate your way between them, between what it says in the regulations and what the NIH would expect you to do. There are special protections for children in the regulations intended to protect children from being exploited in research um, as they were in the studies I mentioned involving radioactive tracers or in involving hepatitis. Uh, and the IRB must determine uh, what kind of uh, level of uh, risk is involved to the children. And there are four categories, four big ways to win big uh, in terms of children's research. Two of which apply at this institution and the other two of which would very seldom if ever apply at this institution. Research must be either uh, not involving greater than minimal risk, which is category 404, or involving greater than minimal risk but presenting the prospect of direct benefit, benefit to the individual subject. This is the category which you hope most research would fall into. There are occasions where there is research involving greater than minimal risk uh, where you can reasonably predict that there will be individual benefit, that the child is not being sacrificed for the benefit of the class as a whole in the future. Research involving greater than minimal risk but presenting the prospect of direct benefit would be include things like uh, uh, cancer chemotherapy trials like Dr. Close is involved in, where they're testing new combinations of proven chemotherapeutic agents. And all of these agents have um, rather serious side effects, but you know, the alternative is, is so much worse that it's, it's, it's acceptable to expose children to the risks of these chemotherapeutic agents. Some research may involve greater than minimal risk, but no uh, prospect of direct benefit to the individual subjects, uh, but likely to yield generalizable knowledge. Now that's a kind of a tricky one. You'd really have to justify that really hard to the IRB that the, you would be putting children at greater than minimal risk with no benefit to them uh, as individuals uh, in order to benefit the class as a whole. And then there's other research which uh, is kind of those unique circumstances which, uh, in which an opportunity exists that would otherwise not exist. We would never ever do one of these. We would very seldom approve one of these. Most of the research we approve is 404 or 405. The problem with these categories is that the uh, federal government now mandates that children be included in drug trials uh, you know, for new drugs uh, if they're going to be used in children because one of the problems that has arisen with this kind of regulation is that uh, manufacturers have avoided testing drugs in children and now we have a whole class of drugs which have been approved for by the FDA and which are used in children where the manufacturers have no idea whether there is a difference in the metabolism in children, uh, difference in the sensitivity, uh, difference in the effect of the drug and uh, physicians just basically sort of ramp down the dose uh, on a body weight basis and so there's no research being done. 
Now, now they want. Uh, now the FDA and the uh, NIH wants children to be included in research unless you can provide a, a strong justification as to why they should not be included. Now, the issue of how to uh, whether a child can refuse to take part in a study uh, is is a, a thorny one. Uh, although a child may be mature enough to give inf- a child may not be mature enough to give informed consent, generally they should be asked if they want to take part in the study, particularly if the research offers no direct benefit to the child. So, for example, in some drug studies, uh, they will want to do a pharmacokinetic study, and uh, uh, that is an interesting thing that they want to find out how the drug is handled by the body and how the blood levels change after the dose uh, but the, all the child is going to see is 10 or 12 needle sticks uh, and so you should ask them and some children will say yes and some children will say no um, obviously the, the consent of the child's parent must also be obtained there are circumstances uh, where the child will say no and in most cases the, even if the parents consent the child's views should prevail they must prevail um, however there are circumstances where the parental consent can be considered sufficient even if the child does not assent if the IRB determines that the research offers the prospect of direct benefit only available in the context of the research and that's where Dr. Close's studies fall uh, the, the, the side effects if they were presented to a child you know, you're going to get uh, you're going to get, uh, get sick. You're going to feel lousy. Your hair's going to fall out, uh, but you'll survive at the end of it. Um, the child may not have the critical faculty to be able to say, "Well, I think I'll weigh the risks and benefits and come out with uh, I think I'd like to live." They'll say, "I just don't." You know, throwing up is not something that children like to anticipate. In that case, it may be it may be appropriate for the IRB to say that the parental consent is sufficient. What we normally have for children over the age of eight is uh, an assent form, which is a simplified, very, very simplified version of the consent form. For children who are in their uh, early to mid to late teens, we may actually have them sign the consent form uh, in addition to their parents to indicate their approval. So there, there are different ways of doing it. If a child is under eight, we don't regard them as capable of making any kind of decision uh, about whether to take part or not. Fetal research is a, uh, is a thorny issue. It has all sorts of moral and ethical and political implications. But the regulations uh, are kind of clear on what research is appropriate with fetuses in utero. I'm not talking about embryo research or anything like that, but I'm talking about research of fetuses in utero. Uh, the research must propose to meet the health needs of the fetus. That's one criterion. Or the risks to the fetus are considered to be minimal and the purpose of the research is to develop important biomedical knowledge that cannot be obtained by other means. Um, at our institution, most of the research involving fetuses in utero uh, is intended to meet the health needs of the fetus. So, for example, Dr. Ross in OBGYN is looking at ways of uh, altering the amniotic fluid volume uh, in, in mothers who present with oligohydramnios. And that is clearly intended to meet the health needs of the fetus. And so we can approve that. When you're talking about uh, research involving fetuses, it's not generally known that the consent of both parents is required. Uh, and again, that harks back to the 1980s, the early 1980s. Um, nowadays, I think people would agree that, the, uh, or many people would, would believe that the mother's consent is the only consent that, that counts. But the regulations say both parents have to consent to fetal research. However, there is some wriggle room uh, <coughs> unless the father's identity or whereabouts cannot reasonably be ascertained. Uh, he is not reasonably available, and then, then the no-brainer of the pregnancy resulted from, from rape. Uh, how officiously you strive to uh, find the father is something that is uh, basically uh, between you and your, your conscience. Uh, but the, the, technically, you have to seek the, the consent of both parents. And Dr. Keller nearly had a cow when I, I told her that. <laughs> but uh, I, I did point out that you know, she, could, 
she could take as, as much or as little time to look for the father as she wanted. Special for protection for prisoners. Uh, we don't study prisoners at this institution, um, basically because we don't have any, and we have no access to them. Uh, but in the 1960s, prisoners were um, the, the, the group of choice for, for drug uh, testing because they ha offer one great advantage over members of the general population. Uh, you know where they're going to be at all times. You don't have to worry about them showing up for appointments. You, you, you know exactly where they're going to be. Uh, and you can control their environment to a certain degree. Uh, the problem, though, and it's, it may seem difficult for you to uh, appreciate that when you, you have in your mind a picture of a, a 350 pound health angel with, with tattoos all over his arms, but prisoners are exquisitely vulnerable to coercion uh, because they live in a controlled environment where privileges of the, the most minute nature uh, can be withheld or given uh, in order to manipulate their uh, behavior. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult to avoid a situation where you uh, do anything but coerce prisoners to take part in research. Uh, and so there are certain types of research which are absolutely forbidden to be carried out in prisoners and they're in the regulations. Uh, and then for other types of research which are permitted, uh, in order to approve it, you have to have a prisoner or a prisoner advocate on your IRB approving it. The University of Texas at Galveston did a lot of research on prisoners, and it didn't follow the regulations, and they got shut down for it. So uh, we don't do prisoners at this institution. There are certain categories of research which are not are defined as not requiring IRB approval, although we look at it anyway. Let's talk about the exempt research. There, there are categories that are listed in the regulations right at the very beginning that say the regulations don't apply to this type of research because it's minimal risk. And there are six big ways to conduct research uh, that's exempt. Um, educational studies such as comparison of teaching methods, we very seldom get that unless we're looking at you know, teaching residents and, and evaluating methods, mostly for, for schools. Educational tests, and that's survey, questionnaires, interviews, uh, anything like that, um, except if identifiers are included and the information is sensitive, and that and is an important uh, conjunction. You can do educational test research that is exempt if you use no identifiers and you're looking at sensitive information. Or you can use identifiers and not look at sensitive information. But if you have both together, then it's no longer exempt. It doesn't mean you can't do the research. It's just not, it's no longer exempt. Uh, educational tests of public officials and candidates is regarded as, as being exempt and there's no protection for, for public officials or candidates. You can do what you like with them. Um, existing data, if publicly available or without identifiers, we'll get back to that in just a second. Agency-sponsored demonstration studies. If the agency wants to evaluate whether its programs are working, then it's exempt. It can do it. And taste and food quality evaluation and consumer preference studies. These are the people that come up to you in the mall and ask you if you'd like to take 20 minutes of your time to go and compare uh, a new chocolate bar with the, with the current chocolate bar. Um, and so we don't do that either. Basically, we focus on educational tests and existing data. All right, let's talk about existing data. <laughs> Uh, the federal regulations exempt from IRB review research involving the collection or study of existing data, documents, records, da, 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 da. If these sources are publicly available or if the information is recorded by the investigator in such a manner that subjects cannot be identified directly or through identifiers linked to the subjects. And this is, this is your classic give the resident a project to do, do a chart review type study. Uh, and there's a lot of misunderstanding and our opinions about this have evolved over the years. So I may have told you something else in the past, but this is what I'm telling you now. Existing data means data that was in existence prior to proposing the research because if the data comes into existence during the conduct of the research, the, pro the, the opportunity for seeking consent is present. So it can't be something that you will 
collect the next three months' worth of data on a particular condition. It has to be the last three months. Uh, and identifiers linked to the subjects means that any way in which the information gathered to be, could be linked to the individual subjects. And that includes names, social security numbers, harbor hospital numbers, code lists. There have to be no identifiers linking the, the data to the subjects for it to be considered exempt. Now, there are ways to go where you can have identifiers, uh, but it's no longer exempt. And in th those circumstances, you may elect to go the waiver of consent route and, and make the case that the, this uh, particular research, uh, you should not have to seek the consent of the subjects. But the patient's data that you're collecting, they never consented to have you look at it. You're getting a private peek at their medical information, and so you have to make it as anonymous as possible. There are several categories of expedited uh, research in the Federal reg Register. They're updated periodically. They're usually minimal risk studies. They're found in our submission form packet. They generally require a consent form. They generally can be approved on an interim basis by the vice chair and are subsequently in, uh, ratified by the IRB. Uh, but but they, are, they will go through the system somewhat faster. Now let's talk uh, briefly about the Food and Drug Administration, which operates under different rules from the rest of the federal government. 21 CFR 50 and 56 for the, uh, the operation of IRBs and the issue of consent, and 21 CFR 3112 for uh, investigational new drugs, and 8112 for investigational devices. Why is the FDA different from the rest of the federal uh, government in terms of research? Well, first of all, the FDA generally doesn't sponsor research. The FDA generally accepts research presented to it. Uh, and it it's accepting research and evaluating research presented to it uh, with a view to whoever is presenting it ultimately convincing the FDA to approve it for commercial uh, marketing. Uh, and so it has a somewhat different uh, focus. Um, their focus is more on evaluation of, uh, of uh, safety and efficacy uh, of drugs and devices and less on the, uh, the uh, development of generalizable knowledge. FDA studies will include new drugs and devices, studies of approved drugs and devices for new indications, studies which alter the approved dosage, dosing schedule, method of delivery, target population, etc. Basically, once a drug is approved by the FDA, it's approved for a very specific series of uh, indications under very specific conditions for very specific populations. Uh, Another reason for increasing the generalizability of your, uh, of your study, if you, if you study more types of people, then you'll get uh, you know, a wider approval from the FDA. Uh, but any change in the packaging, any change in the method of delivery, from anything like that has to be approved by going through the clinical trial process. Studies of new drugs... Uh, generally require that the investigator or the sponsor seek an investigational new drug application. Uh, studies of new devices, depending on how different the device is from currently available devices and when those available devices first were made available, may require an investigational device exemption. So these are the two, the yin and yang of drugs and devices. When we're talking about investigational devices, uh, the IRB has an additional role over and above the evaluation of the protocol that the device is going to be used in. They also may have to make a determination if the device is a significant risk device or a non-significant risk device before they even evaluate the protocol. Significant risk devices require additional scrutiny by the FDA before being used and are subject to additional monitoring. Investigators uh, will sometimes be involved with devices or drugs as the primary person who is promoting uh, the use of this drug or this device for this indication. Um, if they do act as a sponsor in an investigator-initiated IND or IDE, they assume all of the responsibilities of a commercial sponsor. So be aware of that, uh, that it's not, it's not a, a walk in the park. 
Um, depending on the intent of the use of the drug or device, however, the scrutiny by the FDA may be less than uh, they would use for a, a commercial sponsor, or it may be equivalent. So, for example, if you have an idea that you're going to use a, a particular drug uh, for a new indication, the sponsor, the, the manufacturer of the drug is not interested in it, so you take it upon yourself for an investigator initiated IND, and you hope to finally uh, obtain the rights to commercialize that particular indication, you would have to effectively act as a commercial sponsor. If, on the other hand, you're using the drug in a sort of basic science way, um, uh, and I, I remember that uh, Joel and I used 13-carbon uh, labeled taurine for that, that purpose. We had to get a, an IND, but we weren't held to the same uh, degree of scrutiny as uh, we would if we had been going to use it for uh, developing a commercial version of 13-carbon taurine. Uh, investigators who are involved in a, uh, an IND or an IDE study must submit a Form 1572 statement of investigator. Uh, and uh, in my only blatant uh, revelation of the, way the answers in the test, I will say that this is known as the hanging paper, not old, seven, uh, old 72 and not the, what will send me to the federal penitentiary, but there's a question in there. It's called the hanging paper because if you misrepresent the information on that form, uh, you're uh, committing a felony and you can be put uh, in the federal penitentiary um, for lying on the 1572. Uh, if you're doing an FDA-sponsored study, whether the, whether the drug is actually finally brought to market or whether the, the uh, sponsor decides that they're going to drop the development of the drug or not, you have certain record-keeping responsibilities. You have to keep your records of FDA studies for at least two years after marketing approval or at least two years after the last uh, activity in, uh, in the protocol, after the last drug shipment. So be aware if you're doing those kind of studies, you have certain record-keeping requirements that you're responsible for. Another hot-button topic is genetic research. This is becoming uh, increasingly uh, used. It's becoming increasingly an increasingly powerful tool, and it brings with it a whole raft of ethical issues that uh, I can only touch upon here. Uh, there is obviously the possibility of generation of sensitive information which may affect subject's employment or insurability, or the employment or insurability of relatives of the subjects who are not even involved in the study. Uh, if you find a gene that seems to asso be associated with the development of a particular disease, uh, then if that information became available to an insurer, they may decide that you're a bad insurance risk and deny your insurance. Um, there are ethical dilemmas also regarding provision of data that you find uh, to the subjects. Uh, you know, just because a particular marker is uh, associated with uh, a particular disease doesn't mean that it's uh, a causative agent for the disease. It may just co, you know, uh, co migrate with, with, with the actual uh, marker for the disease. So, what, uh, if you're in the development stage of, of, of understanding this disease, what is your responsibility to tell the patient if you find that they have uh, that particular marker? Are, are you going to cause them more distress by telling them than by withholding the information? How are you going to uh, identify your specimens? Um, if you elect not to use identifiers in the specimens, it, it, does it absolve you, absolve you from attempting to contact the patients if you do find a marker that uh, is indicative of a particular disease? What do you do with future uh, use of the specimens? I mean, it's not uncommon for you to draw a little bit more blood or a little bit more of a specimen than you actually need in order to give yourself some leeway in case you screw up in the, in the assay. And so you'll often end up with a, a freezer full of uh, specimens that are surplus to your needs for any particular study. Are you uh, obliged to seek the prior permission of uh, the subjects uh, about uh, the future use of their uh, specimens. They've given you the specimens having signed a consent form saying that the, uh, the blood will be used for A, B, C, and D. What if 10 years from now you decide to use it for E, F, G, and H? Um, 
Should there be some additional language in consent forms where people have the option of saying, yes, you can use it for other stuff, or no, I want you to destroy it at the end of the study. That I want you to limit my uh, involvement to that. People have tended not to think about that, but when it comes to genetic issues, it com- becomes quite important. Uh, there may need to be additional language added to the consent forms to, ex- you know, to explain exactly what the limits of confidentiality are. Um, there are issues about concerns about privacy of relatives. One of the reasons why Virginia Commonwealth University was closed down was because uh, a patient who was involved in a genetic uh, research study uh, was asked questions about his relatives and gave them information that only he and his relatives knew about certain individuals. And when the investigators approached one of those individuals, he was very upset that somebody other than people that he knew had been told was aware of his particular condition. And he complained, and they did a for-cause audit, and that got them closed down. So there are issues that extend beyond individual subjects to their their families when it comes to genetics research. Uh, Placebos are contentious. I've always been contentious. People who will argue... uh, 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 until they're blue in the face that placebos are never justified but placebos are often used and there are people who argue that the FDA will insist on placebo trials which they adamantly deny that they do but they they may implicitly uh, condone them when is a placebo uh, generally acceptable? Well, it's, it's generally acceptable if you're masking two effective therapies and the only reason for having the placebo is, to, is, is so that you can identify which of one of two active therapies you're actually receiving. Two different colored pills, one of which is active and one of which is not. Uh, it may be acceptable as an add-on therapy. If you're getting your, the standard of care already and uh, you're adding on an additional potentially uh, beneficial therapy, and you want to you know, have a placebo control, then at least you're getting the standard of care. If there is no known effective therapy, a placebo may be an appropriate uh, study design because they are the people who are actually undertaking the risk are the people who actually get the active uh, medication because they are the ones who will suffer the side effects. The placebo person is getting no worse than what they would otherwise get. Uh, even if there is an effective therapy and you're choosing to withhold it, it may be appropriate to have a placebo trial if you have the subject in a controlled environment and you have adequate provisions for rescue therapy. So if you were to take them off of an active medication but keep them in the hospital under close observation and have their, their, ther- the, their normal medication available should, something, you know, should their condition deteriorate, then it may be appropriate to do a, a, a placebo controlled trial uh, even in uh, in the presence, uh, even in, with the existence of an active medication. When is it problematic? When an effective therapy exists. It's problematic to withhold an effective therapy. That's less than the standard of care. It's particularly problematic uh, when oversight of subjects is difficult. Uh, you don't take a psychiatric patient off their medications, uh, put them on a placebo and send them out into the community generally. Uh, unless you have very strong support systems that will allow you to to monitor the activities of that patient. Uh, So there are circumstances where placebos may be appropriate and there are other circumstances where uh, it may be dubious and difficult to justify. In any case, you have to justify it to the IRB. Privacy is a big uh, hot-button issue at the moment. I'd just like to remind you the medical records are private documents. Access by physicians is appropriate to provide patient care, but investigators do not have carte blanche to review medical records. Uh, if you don't have a reason generally uh, to review the medical records, you shouldn't be reviewing them unless you get appropriate uh, approval by the IRB. And to remind you that medical records review involves other people's time and effort. Um, information systems, personnel time to pull the charts, uh, to write the subroutines that will allow them to access some particular information in the HIS. And so you have to carefully justify what you're proposing to do. You can't just toss off a, you know, a 1,500 patient study onto a resident to say, go ahead and do that. There has to be some good justification of it. 
if the IRB is approved the records review request then investigators may review the medical records if you are doing the medical records review to perhaps uh, see how many patients you have who might be eligible at this hospital for a particular study how do you then approach the patients you identify if the subjects are identified an approach to the subject should not be made by the investigator unless the investigator is the patient's primary caregiver because again you're you're revealing the fact that you that you know personal private medical information about a patient that you have no right to know or the patient might think you have no right to know so you should approach the subject only through the subject's primary physician or caregiver we had this problem with uh, with a lot of the HIV studies was that you know people would say well we want to do a study on this and that and they would march into the clinic and say hey I hear that you have HIV and I and people would get very offended, not surprisingly, because they thought they were coming and their, their, their care was confidential. So the, the, the approach has to be made through the person that would normally be seeing them. They can, they, can, they can approach it any way they like. They can say, I've heard of this study, I'd like to tell you about it. If you're interested, you make the approach. You can't just walk up to people. There are databases that have been developed locally. General Internal Medicine has a nifty one. Uh, the, uh, potential gold mines for researchers but uh, Dr. Stringer who developed the database has uh, recognized the potential uh, problems with giving unrestricted access to it and he proposed and the IRB accepted a plan whereby any proposal to use his database has to come through the IRB in the compliance office <coughs> And finally, remember that in, you must be sensitive to the private nature of the information in medical records at all times. Uh, publication must avo avoid any use of identifiers. That's the end of my presentation. And I think I have time for a couple of questions before we're tossed out of here. Uh, before, before I accept questions, let me tell you that there are uh, three ways to take uh, to demonstrate your understanding of the regulations. One is, as you have done, to come to this presentation and then take a test at the end of it, a multiple choice test of 50 questions. The second way you can do anyway, even if you've come to this, is to uh, uh, read the first 90 pages of this book, which is available in multiple copies in the library for, for overnight loan. Uh, it basically covers the same information that I did here, uh, but it's available. You can do an open book test with it. And then you take the test, or if uh, if you haven't attended this presentation, you haven't read the book, you can do as Dirty Harry said, and if you feel lucky, you can just take the test.